Hi, Aishwarya. I think you're muted. Apologies. Hi, everyone. Sorry for that. Uh, I would like to welcome you all for tuning into this session today. Uh, my name is Ashwarya Changappa. I'm a sustainability consultant at Aegis, and I'm a part of the UAE uh, Sibsi UAE uh, committee. I'm also the Sibsi UAE Young Vice Chair. Uh, and uh, today we're glad to join uh, Chijoti, Reha, and Faiza from Rambal, who would be giving the insights on computational design, a disruption in the MEP industry. For those who don't know or happen to be unfamiliar with the SIPSI roles and responsibilities as a region, our role here is to promote the intellectual welfare of its members and to improve the understanding of building services engineering within our society by organizing events and other activities related to the built environment. SIPSI is a professional body that works under the umbrella of the Engineering Council with the three main goals of practice of building service engineering, investing in education and research and supporting the community of the built environment professionals. The session insights are as follows. We would be understanding the computational design uh, subject and the available tools for it. We would understand the application of it within the building service industry, and we would get to know how to work with these tools and get results out of them. I would like to firstly introduce to Jyoti Chaudhamad, our first speaker for today. He is the head of computational design of MEP at Rambal Middle East. He has around 14 years of experience in the industry, is a bachelor's, uh, has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and has an MBA in the dig digital strategy. He's also a lead green associate and a PMP certifi certified personnel. Reha Hansraj is also a graduate MEP engineer at Rambal. She's got a BSc in Architectural Engineering and is currently pursuing her MSc in engineer, Energy. She has around 1.5 years of experience in MEP field and is also a part of our SIPSI committee in the UAE. Faiza is a graduate at MEP, uh, a graduate MEP engineer at Rambal, and she's also uh, a, a bachelor uh, in architectural engineering. She's also currently pursuing her master's in environmental design of buildings at Cardiff University, and is also a member of our SIPC and committee. Just a few housekeeping notes before I make our way to our speakers for today. Please note that this is a technical webinar session and it's being recorded as we speak. This recording will be either published online or shared in due course of time. If you have any questions, you are encouraged to kindly type them out in the Q&A panel of the Teams chat, and they will be addressed by the end of this presentation. Lastly, for the reasons outlined here, to avoid any unwanted disturbances and distractions, your camera will be turned off and your mics will also be muted. In case your mics are not muted, please mute yourself and do not uh, try not to interrupt this session in between. All right, I will hand over it to Chajoti now and uh, hope you guys enjoy our session. Thank you. Hi, um, good evening everyone. I am Chajoti, Head of Computational Design for Rambol in the Middle East. Um, I think Aishwarya has given a fairly good uh, introduction about us, so I'll get right into the presentation. Um, I think you can see on the screen the general topics uh, that will be covered in today's webinar. OK, so we will uh, first be giving a general overview of what is computational design, the processes involved, and why building services industry in general has been on the slower end of the spectrum in adopting computational design when compared to other disciplines within the AEC industry. This shall be followed by a brief overview of the parametric design tools utilized in building services sector and the different tasks that they undertake. Reha and Feza will then further explain these tools by giving a few project-based examples um, on how they can be utilized in automating certain simulations or tasks such as climate analysis, energy modeling, and thermal comfort and CFD. We will then dwell further into automation in MEP through the use of a Rivet-based plugin called MagicAd and conclude the webinar by showcasing certain innovative scripts or ideas that can be used to improve MEP workflow efficiencies, as well as what the future holds for the building services industry. OK, so let's begin.
Computational design uh, is an approach that relies on computer algorithms, simulations, and data-driven processes to generate and analyze complex designs. It is often used in various fields, such as, of course, the AEC industry, product design, and manufacturing. One of the notable examples that computational design is used widely is in the automobile sector for designing cars, especially race cars. Now, um, the key aspects of computational design include a parameter setting or limitations, if you want to call it that way, uh, which involves use of parameters to generate design solutions. These can take various inputs, such as design constraints and other data to produce design iterations or alternatives. When one parameter is changed, the entire design can update dynamically to reflect that particular change. Generative design is a subset of computational design that explores a wide range of design possibilities based on defined objectives and constraints. It can be particularly used in optimizing designs for very specific criteria. Now, through processing power, various simulations and analysis can be done. This may include structural analysis, computational fluid um, dynamics, simulation, energy efficiency, you name it, it can be done. There are no limitations to this. Computational design can incorporate data from various sources. It can include historical data, sensor data, as well as user-based data to improve design processes. Machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques can be used to analyze and leverage this data. Now, the major challenge is to make sense of the data, which will feed back into our design processes. Most importantly, computational design allows for rapid iteration and a live feedback and optimization of design. Designers can explore multiple alternatives quickly and make informed decisions despite intricate and complex geometries. Okay, computational design thinking involves a multifaceted approach that integrates various elements to solve complex design problems. They are um, decomposition breaks down a complex set of problems into its constituent parts, um, identifying the key aspects that need attention. Pattern recognition, of course, um, is the ability to identify recurring trends and periodic work, you know, patterns within data, user behaviors, or even existing design iterations that can inform design processes. Recognizing these patterns can help us improve workflow efficiencies. Abstractions includes simplifying complex information uh, by removing the unnecessary bits while retaining the essential characteristics. So these abstractions can help develop algorithms that operate on abstracted design elements to guide their operation. These algorithms can generate design alternatives, simulate performance and optimize solutions. Now let's go further into computational design in the building services sector and why MEP in particular has been slow in comparison to architecture and structures in adopting computational design. The reasons behind these are several. There is a growing complexity of building systems. Clients are becoming more demanding. Design might be constrained by physical or functional requirements. There are regionally varying um, codes and standards and there are also well-established standards which make development of computational scripts between different regions fairly complex and difficult. The technology as well as the standards and codes are constantly changing, so these scripts would need a lot of maintenance, and of course there is a high degree of expertise and understanding required uh, to design MEP system. And in general, there is a lack of computational designers with an MEP bias which further, further exacerbates this problem. And it is because of this particular reason that for MEP, an organic growth may make sense and reap greater benefits. Now, implementing and utilizing computational design into already existing workflows that people are comfortable with is a change. And people are resistant to change. And for change to happen, it needs champions. The champions drive the change and give it direction. While the drivers, backed by guiding engineers, work towards that change through collaboration 
among various disciplines such as BIM engineers, computational designers, etc. This is one of the ways in which an organization can grow and implement computational design within its, within its workflow processes. OK, now let's get more into the fun part. Uh, as I mentioned before, computational design encompasses processes that automate repetitive tasks and improves workflow efficiencies. Now, there are several software currently that are capable of doing this, but I'm now going to mention just a few software that are widely used currently already in the AEC industry. Uh, these are uh, Rhino, Grasshopper, which is a plugin within Rhino, and in turn, Grasshopper has many plugins that we can use on a day-to-day -day basis to generate and simulate computational design scripts. Rivet, of course, uh, and associated plugins like Dynamo and MagicAd, which is a Rivet-based plugin. Now, through the use of computational design software, an architectural model can be converted into an energy and thermal model on which various simulation and analysis can be run by using parametric modeling through the processes below. You know, these are very powerful, especially during initial design stages to conduct analysis, iterations, and influence architectural design. Progressive changes in architecture, such as a variation, etc., can be analyzed efficiently and results can be obtained by plugging in the already established scripts into the model. Now, the icons on the right, um, they show different plugins uh, that Grasshopper utilizes. Each and every icon is a plugin and it has very specific use. For example, the plugin right at the top um, is Ladybug, where the laser is pointing to. Uh, it helps us to do weather analysis, thermal comfort analysis, wind analysis, uh, radiation analysis, and so on. Honeybee is more to do with energy modeling, load balancing, and HVAC load analysis. Dragonfly performs detailed energy simulations. It also does district cooling and heating analysis, as well as urban heat island analysis. Butterfly is mainly used for CFD simulations and indoor thermal comfort, while Ironbug at the very end, um, it is mainly used for HVAC sizing and performing life cycle cost analysis. And the next slide shows the benefits of all of this, where our ideas become reality. So to give you a few further insight on this, um, we can have easier modeling with lesser errors because the human interaction is reduced and there is not much scope for human-based error. Changes to any parameter can be made by just clicking a few buttons. As I said before, uh, we can assign limitations and certain parameters um, and then run the scripts. So the algorithm functions itself that way. Results can be achieved in a better, more graphical and visual format. So our reports can be easier even for a non-technical person to understand. The same parametric scripts can be reused for multiple projects. So it's just like a plug and play. You get the model from an architect and then you just insert into the model and voila, you have um, you know, run the script and get, got many simulations. So MEP systems can also be designed more sustainably by incorporating a few sustainability aspects into the scripts. Multiple analysis and iterations can be done over a single integrated platform. It, and, and as such, it creates a smarter and more efficient workflow. Now, to give you further insight on these plugins and analysis that can be performed on them, um, it's over to Reha and Feza, who will take you through the next few slides. Hi everyone, this is Reha here. So today I'll be talking about climate analysis and how climate analysis can influence design decisions. All right, so as Jyoti mentioned previously, Ladybug is a climate analysis tool on Grasshopper. So through Ladybug, we can perform several analysis such as sun path analysis, shadow studies, radiation studies, psychrometric charts, outdoor comfort studies, and we can also generate climate data plots. So through Ladybug, we're able to analyze all of this climate data as well as create interactive visualizations. 
OK, so now let's talk about why we need climate analysis. As many of you may know, climate analysis has the potential to influence designs. So that can be in the form of changing the orientation or layout of the building, probably changing the envelope and glazing properties, HVAC design, thermal comfort, indoor air quality, renewable energy, climate resilience, cost savings, as well as building code compliance. So the figure that you see on the right over here is one of the visualizations created by Ladybug. So this is a sun path analysis and on the top over here you have other analysis such as wind speed, sky dome radiation and wind direction analysis, which I'll be talking about in the coming slides. All right, so now I'll show you an example of the sun path analysis over here. So in this video, you see this rectangle over here. This is basically a parameter. So as I change this parameter on Ladybug, my sun path over here, which has been generated, also changes. So this parameter over here is actually the orientation of the building. So as I change the orientation of the building, and even if I change the time of the day or the day of the month, the sun path changes by itself. So without much manual effort, if I have a script ready, I can easily generate results in less time. Here are some other solar analysis that I've performed on Ladybug. Um, an example over here is direct sun hours on the building surface. Over here you can see the same analysis is done on the context or you can see the surroundings of the building. And over here you can see a sky dome radiation analysis, which is essentially just a hemisphere around the building, which shows the radiation as well as the direction of the radiation. So now here's an example of how we can perform a radiation analysis on the surface of the building. So over here we have our grasshopper script and Currently in the video, I'm plugging in a model into the script. So this model over here was the main building, and now I'm going to plug in the surrounding buildings. Now with a click of a button, you can see how the radiation results appear on the building. All right, so it was very effortless. If you just have a script ready and you plug in the model as well as the surroundings, you can see the climate analysis being performed in seconds. Now here's an application of the radiation analysis uh, in MEP design. So over here using Ladybug as well as an artificial intelligence uh, plugin called Galapagos, I've basically tried to find in which orientation and in which inclination of the solar panel would I receive the maximum radiation, which in turn makes the solar panels more efficient. So using this radiation analysis tool, uh, we can determine the F, uh, at which orientation the panels will be more efficient, which can uh, further you know, give us an idea of whether we have potential to generate renewable energy from the panels, or maybe we can generate hot water using solar panels. Now let's talk about daylight analysis. So th uh, through computational design, we can actually create scripts in which we can edit the window to wall ratio and then the script over here is telling us whether we are receiving adequate daylight into the building or not and over here you can see these four terms failing supplemental acceptable excessive so this script is basically telling us whether the amount of daylight that enters due to the window to wall ratio if it's lead compliant or not so through computational design scripts uh, I'm also able to identify whether my design is able to comply with any regulation such as LEED or Estadama. 
Now, here's an example of a shadow analysis that we've done on one of our projects. So this project is basically a studio development in which there'll be recordings and shootings of movies. So you see this uh, blue rectangle over here. This is basically a water stage and the client did not want any shadow to fall on the stage at any point of the year. So we had to find an optimal location to locate this stage such that there won't be any shade falling onto this water stage. As you can see, there were many buildings around it. So through computational design, we tried to assess what would be the most optimal configuration. So over here we had a utility plot and we determined that by locating the utility plot up here in the north and relocating the water stage in the south would basically uh, kill two birds with one stone. Why? Because in the north we had all of the main authority lines running. So that gave us an easier connection to the utility plot. And the second point is that by relocating the water stage to the south, there was no shade falling on it. So through computational design, we were able to achieve all of these solutions. Here's an other example of shading. Um, this is for one of our other projects where we were assessing external shading. So the blue zones indicate the areas that have been shaded and the yellow zones indicate the areas that receive direct sunlight and minimal shade. Um, and this script also told us whether it was complying, the external shading, if it was complying with uh, Estadama codes. Finally, I have this wind analysis over here. So through Ladybug, we can generate wind roses. So this wind rose actually tells us which direction receives the maximum winds and at any point of the year, what is the prevailing wind and what are the seasonal winds? So over here on the right side, we've generated four different wind roses at different seasons of the year. All right, now I'll hand it over to Faiza. She's going to give you an idea of about how we'll perform energy modeling using computational design. Hello everyone. Um, so another potential of computational design is energy modeling. Um, computational design serves as a great tool for carrying out energy modeling and optimizing building performance. OK, so um, through computational design, um, we can easily create an energy model, and this can be done using a tool called Honeybee, Honeybee which is again a plugin in the Grasshopper tools. So Honeybee is a plugin in the Grasshopper tools, and it could help us achieve uh, creating from creating the geometry for the energy model to several analysis being carried out on that energy model, such as thermal comfort, cooling energy usage, energy balance visual, visual, visualization, HVAC sizing, and daylight analysis. So the process of creating an energy model through computational design is very simple. You receive an architectural model as seen in the video, and then you put in your energy inputs such as construction materials, your program types, um, your all the kinds of energy inputs. And then once your energy model is ready, as you can see, we are plugging it in the model into the script on the right. And once that model is ready you can carry out several analysis on that model um, on the screen right now is a very simple analysis that was ca carried out that is the surface temperature um, so this is very similar to creating an energy model on um, other software but the benefit here is as you all know that the industry is moving towards the usage of rhino and having the project model already built in Rhino could make the geometry building process much more efficient and save a lot of time. And secondly, once you have the energy model ready, you can do multiple analysis at once and you can get live feedback. You can also combine analysis and get various results that will be seen on the further slides. 
Okay, so one of the analysis that we have tried out in Ramball is thermal loads analysis. So in the industry, conventionally, HAP and IES have been widely used for thermal analysis. But we also tried out computational design, which is, again, um, very simple plug and play kind of a method where you just plug in your model and you can get your uh, analysis done. So we had tried it out for one of the projects. And as you can see, there is quite a bit difference between the results, but this is something that we're still looking into. But computational design makes it uh, much more simpler and easier and efficient as it's just a plug and play method. Um, some other energy simulations that can be carried out are, for example, energy balance chart. So, um, an energy balance chart, for example, can be a very important analysis to understand where most of the loads in your building are located. So, as, as you can see on the top left, the energy balance chart. Um, so, the blue bars are the cooling, and the bars on the top are actually the are showing you what what are the heat gains or the gains which are causing those cooling. And from this chart, you can actually understand where most of the loads in your uh, in your building is located. So this can be a very important analysis for your concept design stage. And similar analysis are shown on this slide that can be carried out through a plug and play method. For example, on the bottom is a chiller and electricity energy chart. So you just plug in your model, you you just design the HVAC inputs and you understand what is your chiller electricity energy. And on the right, you can see the peak cooling loads, which is visually represented. That is your cooling loads for each room. Now, these kind of visual re representations can be very uh, helpful for a non-technical person to understand. And these all these kind of analysis could be helpful to put in your uh, project report, especially at the concept stage. So you can make a lot of design decisions based on these quick analysis. OK, so once you have your energy model ready, some other things, other analysis that can be carried out include thermal comfort and CFD. As you all know that your HVAC design plays an important role in the thermal comfort as HVAC design can influence the air temperature, the velocity and the direction, and that in turn influences the thermal comfort of your room, your space or your building. So in Ramball, Yeah, in Ramball, we've tried to um, to incorporate thermal comfort analysis on many of our projects. So as you can see on this screen, using the PMV and PPD comfort model as per ASHRAE 55, we tried uh, achieving the thermal comfort for this building. And as you can see that the left side image shows you the PMV results. Um, the scale goes from hot to cold, which is minus three to plus three. And as per ASHRAE, that is, uh, sorry, minus five, minus 0.5 to plus 0.5. And as per ASHRAE, that is what we're trying to achieve um, in terms of thermal comfort. And on the right, you can see this uh, uh, percentage of people dissatisfied. And these are very well visually represented and can help you understand the thermal comfort of your building and what design decisions you can make to influence um, your building's thermal comfort. Another thing that we tried was um, UTCI, that is outdoor thermal comfort. These two images just show you the difference of the outdoor thermal comfort with and without trees. And Last but not the least is CFD. So CFD can be done through another plugin called Butterfly. So Butterfly is a plugin which helps you achieve CFD uh, on Rhino, on your model. And you can combine it with Honeybee with your energy model to understand your airflow directions, the temperatures, and the velocities. Now, this is the point where you can combine different analysis. So you can combine your CFD with your thermal comfort analysis to eventually understand the comfort of the room, your airflow directions, your temperature, and velocities. 
So through energy modeling, once you have your energy model, you can perform multiple analysis at once. You can get live feedbacks. You can um, change different parameters and you can understand how your building will perform by changing those certain parameters and you can obtain the best solution. OK, so now we come to automation in MEP. Um, we will be we we are trying to do this in Ramball through a software called Magicad, which is actually a plugin in Revit. Okay, so Magicad is a plugin in Revit which helps you automate several um, sizing, like for example, your ductwork sizing, your pipework sizing. So on the left, you can see is a ductwork. Um, and all of these diffusers are basically in different spaces. And what hap what's happening in the video here is that you just put in your flow rates in all of these diffusers. You select your calculation method and Magicad will have all of this ductwork sized automatically. And this is what we are trying to do in Ramble, but another step ahead would be using Revit's cooling load analysis. So all of the spaces would have their cooling load done um, through Revit, and all of the diffusers would have the airflow rates updated on their own and the ductwork, ductwork size automatically. So this would be a complete automatic process if we make the right use of Magicad. And on the right, on the right, the video is showing us a bunch of FCUs which are connected to chill water pipes. And um, if you just put in the flow rates for each of these FCUs, Magicad would will automatically size the chill water pipes. As you can see that the numbers changed. So Magicad automatically sizes the chill water pipes or any pipe work system, um, just depending on the calculation method. Another thing that you can achieve through Magicad is automatic pressure drop calculations. So um, the video you can see over here with the FCUs and the pipe work, this video will basically, no, the video in the center. So that video just shows you basically if you select a calculation method, if you select a calculation method and Magicard will help you calculate the pressure drop within that system, be it a ductwork or a pipework. Also, my, uh, Magicard can identify the most critical route for the pressure, pressure loss calculation, which is very essential. And the last thing that Magicard can do is also um, calculate pipework or ductwork lengths automatically. So if you have a very huge pipework and instead of manually calculating the length of that pipework or the ductwork, you can calculate it through Magicad automatically. Now I'll hand it over to Reha to discuss all the other benefits of Magicad and automation in MEP. All right. Um, so now I'll be talking about how Magicad can be useful in builders' work. So as you all know, um, MEP services have to go through structural slabs. So conventionally what would happen is that MEP engineers would give markups to the structural engineers identifying, OK, where do I need the cutouts in my slabs? And it would be like a back and forth communication. But through Magicad, we can automatically locate in the model and uh, like where we would require an opening for our services, as you see, as you can see over here, uh, through a click of a button, the software was able to identify what the opening in the slab would be. So that just makes life more easy. Uh, you can see in this image on the right side over here, all of these MEP services have this a red color indication around it. So that is just Magica telling you that you need an opening around your service over here. So you can, uh, so there's no need of going back and forth to, to the structural engineer. You can just send them your model and they'll be able to view the required openings live in the model itself. Okay. Uh, so we've discussed how Magicad can be useful in mechanical services. Now let me just give you an insight on how it can be useful for electrical services. 
So in this video over here, you can see how we can use magic Ad to create easy circuiting between electrical components. And through a little bit of scripting on Dynamo, uh, which is also a kind of computational platform within Revit, uh, we can easily convert 2D components uh, from AutoCAD into 3D BIM families. So in this video over here, we're currently exporting those 2D components. And you can see soon that all of these 2D components will be converted into Revit families. Yeah, see it turned into a 3D block. OK, so the next few slides talk about what's in store for the building service industry in the future and how computational design would influence the trajectory of the AC industry. Um, to begin with, Reha will take you through the first slide. All right. Uh, so I'm sure many of you have heard about the term embodied carbon. So it's basically the carbon emissions of a particular product throughout its life cycle. Now the embodied carbon value or the embodied carbon data is very much available for let's say structural elements or architectural elements, but when it comes to MEP, the data is very scarce. So SIBC has come out with these guidelines, SIBC TM65, which defines the calculation methodologies for embodied carbon for MEP systems in particular. Um, and to calculate the embodied carbon of uh, MEP systems, it's a lot of manual tedious work. There's a lot of Excel sheets that you need to send to manufacturers, review it, give them feedback, all of that. But if we integrate this, these Excel sheets, these calculations, into Grasshopper or using computational design, if we can make the calculation process much more easy. So this is just an idea or something that we're looking to develop in the future. We want to integrate um, the Excel calculations along with whatever architectural model that we get. We want to plug it into Grasshopper and basically get an immediate or an estimate calculation of the embodied carbon. All right, now I'll hand it over to Chijoti. Thank you, Reha. Well, um, you can see that there is a lot of, um, you know, data that is involved, you know, in um, getting the information that is not available and then integrating that into computational design. So it is how to make sense out of that data. That is primarily the key here. Now, um, um, I want to scratch uh, your brains, you know, to kind of take you through a few core ideas, a few hypothetical and imaginary situation um, that may significantly impact the way we do things. Um, I'll primarily be taking you to through um, through two applications. Um, one of which is the ceiling void coordination. As MEP engineers, we all know how critical it is to do this exercise initially during the concept stage. So what if this entire process could be automated? Like conventionally, we would get the HVAC engineer, public health engineer, ELV, and the electrical engineer onto one table, you know, kind of, you know, talk back and forth and then discuss, okay, what if we put the duct here? What if we put the pipe here and then squeeze it into a very tightly coordinated space? Um, and then there is a lot of back and forth between the BIM technicians, engineers. So what if all this particular data can be automated? what the engineers may need to do would be kind of just put in some uh, sizes of the building services onto an Excel sheet, load it up onto a computational design script, and voila, you have your uh, ceiling wide coordination automatically generated for you, you know, giving not only one, but multiple options through which the engineer can choose from. Um, just a hypothetical situation, but, you know, all this would increase design efficiencies, it would enhance workflows and reduce cost. Just kind of showcasing the power of computational design. Um, now, if you go on to this slide, um, another application would be to convert electrical load schedules into single line diagrams. Um, what would typically happen is that your electrical engineer would populate the 
Excel sheet, develop load schedules, and then convert those Excel sheet into a markup, which would then be given to a BIM technician to kind of, um, you know, draw it all up. And then whenever there is a variation, a change in design, or, you know, even if God forbid that the mechanical engineer comes in at the last moment and says, no, there's a change in load, or some specialist consultant comes in at the last moment and says there's a significant change in load, then the entire process would happen all over again. Now, I think the electrical engineers would be able to understand, um, you know, the the task involved in converting these schedules into a single line diagram. Now, what if we could automate all of this? Well, it's just uh, food for thought. So um, that's what, you know, we are trying to kind of brainstorm a few ideas um, and then, you know, see where best we can improve workflow efficiencies in the computational uh, design field. The, um, you know, possibilities are endless. Now, after the webinar is over, I would like you all to kind of, you know, take a moment, brainstorm in your own head the different ideas on how computational design can be utilized in generating different scripts to improve workflow efficiencies. You know, it can be automating a simple Excel sheet or a simple calculation, or it can be as far-fetched as the ceiling void coordination, electrical single dyne diagrams, you know, space planning of MEP equipment, performing life cycle cost analysis, integration with, you know, other disciplines such as architectural, structural, you know, the, the, the possibilities are endless. So that's the power of parametric design. Now, there, there are a lot of uh, integrating softwares. So to leverage existing software and integrate them all would be the ultimate dream. You know, this is a far-fetched, very visionary way of thinking. There are a few existing plugins that actually makes this possible. While some exist, others may still be in development, while even others may currently not exist at all, you know, and it's a uh, future development. It's only a matter of time that some bright mind may initiate an idea and start a disruption. You know, some of the existing tools that can be utilized are Rhino inside Revit. It is a new plugin for Revit um, that allows Rhino and Grasshopper to load into Revit this allows to integrate Rhino's free form modeling and Grasshopper parametric design into BIM. You know, Immersify um, and the Edge VR, which is actually a virtually virtual reality plugin that allows the designer or anyone using the software to transport themselves into the virtual world and navigate, thereby increasing collaboration and informed decision making. You know, the person can also make comments while virtually being present in the model. You know, such software can be especially used for client presentation to give them a flavor of how their buildings and systems might look like. There are several tools that are being developed as plugins into IES as well um, to further integrate into Rivet, such as IVN, which is an intelligent virtual network that allows local energy decarbonization options to be quickly and easily assessed for any new or existing development. iScan, to optimize building performance at an individual level or across an enterprise portfolio, and ICD to create a sustainable master planning for a development district or e even a city. All this can be brought together um, into a collaborated cloud over one platform um, and give rise to a digital twin command center. Now, um, this particular slide talks more about digital twin and gives some information about it. Now, what is a digital twin? Um, a digital twin is basically a virtual replica or a representation of a physical object, a system, or a process. It is a digital counterpart that mimics the behavior, characteristics, and status of its physical counterpart in real time or real near time. Now, digital twins are currently used across various industries, and we ourselves, as MEP engineers, um, use digital twins. Um, in the form of a BIM model. Um, you know, a BIM model is a simple example of a digital twin, but the application are currently limited. By making use of big data, and more importantly, the right kind of data, if we find, you know, ways to filter the data and use relevant data, we can expand our horizons, not only to use digital twin um, during the design phase, but also during operation and maintenance. You know, through the use of historical data, sensor data, and user-defined data, digital twins can be used in a wide variety of design phases. You know, um, it can start with um, exactly as I mentioned during the design processes, 
uh, to feed back into the design. Um, it can be used during construction and identify potential issues before the construction even begins. Um, it can monitor the progress of MEP system installations, ensuring that they adhere to specifications, etc. Real-time data from sensors um, can be utilized to feed back into the construction program. Um, even after the building is completed, the digital twin can continue to serve as a valuable tool for facility management and maintenance. Predictive maintenance algorithms can be applied um, to anticipate and address issues with MEP systems before they even come to face. Um, and by integrating Internet of Things, sensors and data analytics with digital twin, building owners and operators can monitor um, and analyze um, the performance of MEP systems in real, in real time and optimize energy efficiency. So all in all, now imagine um, a developer like Emar, um, you know, implementing digital twin and who wishes to utilize a digital twin on an enterprise level um, through Internet of Things and machine learning, artificial intelligence. What if an equipment in one building can communicate with a similar equipment in another building? You know, and make it more efficient. Possibilities are endless. Now, I would like to conclude this presentation with that simple thought. Um, but overall, I would suggest uh, each engineer who is attending this webinar to get out of their comfort zones and play their part in bringing the AEC industry and more importantly, the building services industry at the forefront in utilizing computational design tools. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I would introduce everyone to uh, start and giving in your questions in the Q&A tab. I think we've got a question from Reed Dono and asking us to go back to the honeybee slide at the end. Uh, would you mind sharing your slide, Reha? Yeah, sure. Is it this one? Not sure, Reed. Is this the one that you were looking for? No, and I if think you have any questions, the previous one. And if you have any questions, please post them um, on the Q and A tab on top. Uh, maybe we should give him access to the mic so he can ask yeah. his question. Yes, sir. Reed, you have access now if you want to speak up. Yes. Hi, Reed. Hi, right, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. If you go back a few slides, there was a honeybee slide that was flicked. Quickly passed. It was an introduction to the honeybee. This one? Yeah, this one. And that's the one, yeah. Just wanted to see a summary of what that actual plugin um, can, you know, can physically do. Um, obviously, you went through the slides subsequent to that, but that's that's a really interesting way of um, giving all of the insights to what that actual plugin can actually do, yeah. So do you use that on a daily basis, guys, at Rambo, in terms of what you've just presented? I mean, um, we are trying to experiment around with it. Um, we kind of have done a few scripts all in their initial stages. So it's kind of a research and development. Uh, at present, we are just trying to um, improve our, the way that our report reads. Um, the visualization so it'll be easy for a non-technical person to understand because you know in in the industry we get comments from various people not only who are very MEP technically sound but also um, developers and you know commercial guys asking us questions and how systems work and why do we need to use that particular system um, so I think it you know um, the, the, not only Honeybee but the entire all the plugins that we use are mainly focused right now um, on the beginning stage, you know, the concept and the schematic design stage to kind of mm -hmm. influence our reports more so. But yes, it is um, a long-term goal, uh, not only for Ramble, but I think um, even for the entire 
building services industry to kind of make use of computational design and um, you know head in a direction where our workflow um, is 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 easy and made more efficient. I absolutely agree. Yeah. I'm heading up a team at Acom right now. We're we're doing very similar things to you guys, so it's good to see that you know every all the all the major consultancies need to you know invest in this knowledge base and start to use it as a you know these tools as a a, a thing we use every day. You know, not a nice yeah. to have thing, but just a, a natural progression of our design to bring exactly building services to the same level as say our structural colleagues that have been using these tools for a long time. Yeah, and as you said at the start, we're we're some years behind, but it doesn't take much effort to bring us back up to speed, so to speak. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very, very, very interesting presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any Thank you, other Reed. questions? Yeah, we have another question by Mubashir. He says uh, that you mentioned AI in the last slides. Do you implicate the usage of AI techniques such as AWN and heuristics on the CFT models that's digital twin of the actual buildings? Oh, yes. Um, you know, long term, that's the goal, but it's kind of a far fetched idea. It's a very hypothetical situation as of now. And, you know, the um, to to make that work, actually, we need to kind of you know move together as an industry. You know, it's not like a one company or a one person um, effort. Um, and definitely, you know, the as I mentioned before, the possibilities are endless. There are no limitations to this, so we can kind of implement anything. All that needs is you know we need to kind of split um, the problem into smaller parts and then run an algorithm and achieve it. So yes. Um, Anything can be achieved um, to, to, to keep it short. Thanks, Jijati. Uh, we have one more question from uh, Kalyan Lakshman. He says that is Rhino, or he or she, sorry, uh, is Rhino useful for MEP design and modeling Revit during the detailed design stage as well? Well, um, we can see that most of the uh, architects are moving towards Rhino. So currently, our application of Rhino in the MEP field is limited. Um, we are more comfortable with BIM, but we we need to kind of uh, look back, say, 15 years back, and no, when nobody was comfortable using BIM and everyone was registering that change. So yes, so the industry is heading there. Uh, while um, you know, a Rhino is not extensively used for building services as of now. It is extensively used for structures, architectures, facades, and you know, a, a lot of disciplines within the AEC industry. And, you know, as I mentioned before, and even as Reed pointed out, we are a bit behind, but we need to um, catch up and it is uh, a difficult road ahead, but I'm sure that that can be a possibility. But yes, Rhino can be utilized in modeling MEP systems in the near future. I think it already exists. It's just that it's not widely accepted or widely implemented, to put it that way. We have another question by Amir Khan. He says, uh, can you please explain how this is different from IES and is it cost effective compared to IES? Well, I think uh, this was covered by um, Feza. Um, if you can go to that slide, Reha, um, where we have different comparisons between HAP and IES. So um, as I mentioned, um, you know, um, majority of the architectural model these days uh, at least during the initial concept and schema coming out in Rhino as compared to uh, BIM, um, these computational design scripts, you know, make, um, since they run on Rhino, you know, Grasshopper is a plug into Rhino. So these models can be easily plugged in and, you know, just by defining a few um, a certain space typologies, once your script is set, you can just by the click of a button get various loads out, you know, like like the comparison here between a HAP IES and computational design. Now, how it is more efficient? Definitely now in IES, you go and model each and every individual element. You, mo you model each and every space. You, you know, you uh, provide input into the building template manager, set profiles. There's a lot of input that goes into IES. Now, that being said, the same input goes into uh, computational design, but it's kind of a script, which is an all-in-one script, and all you need to do is load the architectural model as as long as they have their you know space typologies and um, you know contours done correctly. 
there is nothing stopping just by the click of a button, you know, in getting the initial, at least the initial loads out. So it saves a lot of time um, and we can run multiple iteration, especially during the initial stages of design. And it kind of gives a good overview of, uh, you know, the cooling load estimates or several other analysis um, that we can run. All right, uh, since we're almost up to time, I would uh, take in a, one more question or two. We have one more from Saurabh Bose who says that is MagiCAD really effective in doing complex shape buildings, mainly in the Middle East, not less complex ones in Schengen countries. Previously, it has had some backlogs. Have they been rectified by now? Now, um, the use of MagiCAD, um, it has been uh, utilized in Ramball. Uh, exactly as you mentioned, um, you know, not on more complex building like the Middle East ones, but it has been utilized um, by our European colleagues in the EU market um, more extensively. Uh, now there are some limitations, but we are trying to kind of, you know, overcome those limitations. Now where, uh, you know, computational design. When I talk about Grasshopper and the likes, they are more as of now. Um, they are more beneficial in the initial stages of design, but where MagiCAD truly finds uh, its workflow efficiencies or, you know, it saves a lot of time is in the detailed design um, phase uh, where you can kind of just, you know, assign uh, loads on your air side equipment and you, you know, voila, you've got your duct sizing, you've got your pipe sizing. Um, you know, there are a few limitations, but we are trying to overcome them um, through, you know, research, R&D and um, uh, we also have um, some we have to make use of, you know, uh, the Internet as a resource as well as uh, certain dinos, dynamo scripts to kind of even tweak the coding to overcome certain limitations. But yes, so um, it is very beneficial, I must say, in the detailed design stages. All right, I think uh, we're done with uh, the questionnaires for this evening. Um, if you have any details that you want to ask personally with Jyoti or Reha or Faiza, please contact them personally and they would feel free to answer your questions. Um, I would like to conclude this uh, session by um, introducing the SIPSI uh, social media platforms and the SIPSI website where you can go and uh, get your membership done. Uh, Reed Donovan, who is present in this uh, meeting, is the SIPSI membership liaison. You can also speak to him about uh, getting uh, membership. And also as the part of the YEN committee, I would encourage all young professionals and uh, students to come in and join our SIPSI YEN platform as well. And yes, uh, I would like to thank again Rambal. I would like to thank for their beautiful presentation and very insightful uh, presentation. And thank you all. See you again next time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Thanks you, everyone. everyone, for joining. Thank you, guys. That was great. Thank you.
Hello.